Welcome to Interviews from Mexico. I'm Laura Carlson, and I'll be your host as we look at cutting-edge issues with the men and women who know them best, here on Telesur. The construction of a new international airport on what used to be Texcoco Lake on the outskirts of Mexico City became a flashpoint in the presidential campaigns and also in the early days of the new presidency. The project touched nerves. It's a multi-million dollar project. There have been accusations of corruption. It's caused a discussion about the environmental impact and also the social impact. It turns out that the construction of the airport is at the same place where there was a proposal to build an airport over a decade ago in the village of Atenco. The people of Atenco mounted a resistance that blocked that early project. And then they were faced with a new project. Today we're going to talk about the implications of this airport and what it meant for Mexican politics. And to do that, we're very happy to have with us America del Valle. America is an activist from Atenco and a member of the People's Front in Defense of the Land. America, thanks so much for being with us here on Interviews from Mexico. Thanks for the invitation. You know, there's a long story behind the resistance of Atenco, and in fact, it's become a symbol of people's resistance, especially to mega projects here in Mexico. After the first round in the early 2000s, how did you feel when President Enrique Peña Nieto, who'd been governor in the state of Mexico when you first confronted the airport project, announced a new project to build an airport on your lands. Well, really, 13 years went by before the airport project was reactivated. And by then, Enrique Peña Nieto was president. I mean, maybe a little after, Atenco suffered through two terms under Enrique Peña Nieto. First, in 2001, we started a struggle against the construction of the airport, and the president at the time was Vicente Fox. In 2006, the way we see it as political punishment for having defeated the, that airport with Enrique Peña Nieto as governor of the state of Mexico, he attacked us, our organization, with extreme violence in 2006. When he had only been governor for a few months, in May of 2006. And through all of those years, until two years before he finished his term as governor, we were in prison. We were locked up as political prisoners for four years. To this day, there are still two murders that have gone unpunished of Javier and Alexis Benumea who were killed during the barbaric events of May 3rd and 4th of 2006. Many women were raped, sexually tortured. Eleven of them are pursuing an international lawsuit in the Inter-American Court. And an atrocious impunity still reigns. So really, we're talking about a resistance that never ended. There was the first phase with the airport. There was a, a brutal repression under Enrique Peña Nieto in 2006, and then there was this phase when the airport is announced again by then President Peña Nieto. How did you maintain that resistance over so many years and with so many of the leaders in prison or, or brutally beaten in some cases, including the assassinations that you mentioned? Well, it's been a hard 16 years. It's been a very hard for our community since we decided to defend the land as our right, as the right of any human being on this planet. When life is threatened, when someone's life is threatened. And the land, that's what the land means for our communities, and especially for us. The people who decided to fight, the people who are from this area, 
who grew up here, who have our grandparents buried here, and we have our roots here. And we also have our future here, our past, and our future too. So it's hard to imagine that from one day to another, they can pull your life out by the roots, in the name of progress, in the name of construction of an airport. Then, 17 years later, it comes up again in a specific situation in a very particular political context after many years of no justice, and not only for Atenco, but also for the whole country, for decades, with almost 80 years of the pre-regime and many years, many decades of struggle, of impunity, of atrocious deaths. And today, today in the 21st century, there are forced disappearances in Mexico. It's reached the breaking point. I think that the accumulation of impunity and injustice was one of the factors that changed things and helped us to decide to make a break, a rupture, on July 1st. And to a certain extent, that rupture favors this struggle, this resistance against the airport. So some of the main demands that you had, just so people can get a picture of it, you know, this is a village, mostly a farming village, uh, where people have probably owned their lands for generations. What were the main demands? You wanted to block the project itself because they were going to expropriate all these lands? When the struggle started, then the People's Front in defense of the land was born to defend this inalienable right, which is the right to defend what is yours. And in this case, that means a piece of land, a piece of heritage, of sovereignty, of history, of identity. So the government first offers to buy the land, and then if you don't sell, they were going to expropriate it? They expropriated it. And there was never an offer to buy it. In 2001, there was never an offer. No prior consultation, no information. They violated every Mexican law, every international agreement, like the International Labor Organization's Article 169. So they violated everything. And for the people, our only option was to fight back, to resist, to defend ourselves. And so we organized, we defended ourselves, we maintained ourselves, and that's how this organization was born. Then the people began to learn, to understand the situation better that it's not just a tango, a little piece of the country. The whole country is like this. And we started learning, along with other campesinos, along with many other groups that are still fighting to this day, especially the different groups that make up our communities. It's not just campesinos, there are housewives, merchants, craftspeople. There are people, there are professionals, there is a range of groups. But the identity that we have, the relationship relationship we have with the land, it's important. It's sacred for us. We got this land back after the revolution in 1929. So when this resistance emerged in 2001, the memory also emerged. We needed to remind ourselves again that we haven't just been here for a few years. We've been here much longer. There is an entire history here. And that history is what make it, makes us take the steps to decide that in this historical moment that we're living in, that we were put into, that it's our, that it's our responsibility to fight, to resist, to build, or to surrender. And we chose the former. When the campaign started, an early promise of Andrés Manuel López Obrador was to cancel this airport project. Uh, he claimed that there was corruption involved, that it was almost a symbol of the kind of crony capitalism and corruption that characterized the previous governments. When you began to hear that, what did you feel? Did you feel hope? Did you feel skepticism? Luckily, Andrés Manuel López Obrador was, when he was a candidate, he was the only one who dared to call this report what it was. He had been saying the exact same thing for 16 years, 17 years, and not just the financial part, that it is a monument to corruption. 
a la corrupción. For us, Era, it also represented a monument to this position, dispossession and impunity because all of the blood that has been spilled, all of the impunity that goes along with this place, which the Mexican state should have to answer for. Because the assassinations and the abuse that took place in 2006 was never punished by, and this was, and this was committed by the police forces, right? It was the police who actually perpetrated the crimes, but the masterminds who planned and ordered the operation that led to the atrocities, it goes all the way up to the chain of command. And it starts with the government of the state of Mexico. At that time, Enrique Peña Nieto, followed by Eduardo Medina Mora, and then Wilfredo Robledo Madrid, Ardelio Vargas Fosado, García Luna, a series of people who are now living in impunity, including Enrique Peña Nieto. Very powerful man. And then Enrique Peña Nieto was rewarded with the presidency in 2012. We think that the repression wasn't just revenge. It was also a way for him to prove himself to the economic empire, to the people with the money, who are the ones who have so far, or up until before this election, maybe, I'm daring to believe, they always decided who they wanted as their, their foreman. The politicians who would protect their interests, their mega projects. And in that sense, the airport was an important symbol too, because of everything implied by the struggle against it, a struggle by people deciding not to be evicted because of a presidential decree, just because a president of a country decides that there is going to be an airport there. It's a poor community, a community that is looked down and despised. So for that community to decide this will not happen here is significant. And that was so, so, it had to do with revenge, but it also had to do with the context of 2006. It was one of the first important battles of Obrador himself. It was one of the most harshly contested elections, and we were part, or we were victims, of a huge propaganda war against López Obrador and against... They played with the intelligence of the people telling the people that since then, and actually this had been going on for decades, we have said consistently enough with the impunity of this regime. Today, we're in, the, in this situation, we have a new context, and the way it seems to us is that it was a good decision, and from the, that point, we made the decision to push and to, make, to take advantage to some extent of our brother's eh, candidacy, since we denounced this airport as a project of corruption. A, a este como una obra de, de and we said, no it's not just corruption, impunidad, it's impunity. Es por, es it's a project based on disposition that needs to be canceled. And if you can say it as a candidate, we hope that as president you actually do it. To make him keep his word. Things have been, they've taken another form, kind of in the discourse especially. Since he became president. After he became president, he announced his national consultation and we took part as an organized community along with many other communities that were affected and they're still being affected today because the construction hasn't been suspended. Well, let's explain a little bit. Let's break this down for people who aren't as familiar with the case. So, so Lopez Obrador becomes president on July 1st. He's elected, becomes president on December 1st. And as part of this campaign, promised to stop the airport which means standing up to very powerful economic and political interests in Mexico, they launch this consultation process where citizens throughout the country can vote whether they want to continue with the airport in uh, Texcoco, where you are, or whether they want to construct an airport or use the old airport. Uh, in or, or build part of an airport in, the, in another place, in this case at Santa Lucia, which has been a proposal. I think we have to mention that in Mexico, the issue of consultations 
are not just popular referendums, which are regulated by the Constitution, but also consultations with indigenous peoples about mega projects. In our country, we have never had a single experience where a consultation complies with and fulfills all of the requirements that are written in the people's right to consultation. Not one of the consultations of the few that have been done has been favorable to the people on the one hand. Mm -hmm. And on the other hand, they rarely even do the consultations. In other words, in this country, they impose mega projects, whether it's mining, dams, whatever airports, and there are no consultations with the indigenous peoples that could be impacted. And that was the case with the Tenco. Since 2001, neither Vicente Fox nor Felipe Calderón nor Enrique Peña Nieto recognized the rights we have as communities. They don't recognize it. Now, things have changed. Obrador called for this national consultation during the transition period, no less. And for us, we had a very complicated discussion about it, and we have to say that, because effectively, we were going to, well, there was a series of ambiguities where the communities, what we wanted was legal certainty. We wanted a guarantee that the results would be complied and respected especially if it was going to be, well, assuming that there would be information before the fact. If you inform people before the fact, you create a current of opinion, where logically you wouldn't think that people will make a reasonable, fair decision to say no to the airport, that the construction in Texcoco should not continue. That was a big concern we had. So the consultation is carried out during the transition period and uh, you were concerned about whether you'd be able to win or not because there was a lot of pressure and a lot of information going out to people to pressure them to vote in favor of continuing with the project and you won. How'd you feel when you won? The result of the national consultation didn't just happen. The consultation was carried out from the 28th from the 25th to the 28th of October. It was the result of 17 years of tireless, constant, permanent struggle. And there was a very effective publicity campaign, too, called Yo Prefiero Lago, or I Prefer the Lake. It seemed to really reach a lot of people that maybe hadn't been involved with the issue before. Exactly. The communities, we had to develop other tools. In addition to fighting back in the streets, grassroots mobilization and political opposition, we had to win after resisting for those long 17 years. We also had to work on something that was built by many people, built with the hands of the communities affected that decided to defend itself and fight back, but also with the help of our collectives and organizations that were willing to work with us. Those groups were very important as well. They understood that the battle to defend the lake implied many other things for this country, not just for Atenco, Texcoco, and the communities, but also for the country itself. So we started the Yo Prefiero el Lago campaign, which had a much farther reach, because, well, fortunately, today we have social networks, which we took advantage of, and we made it work for us. And we were able to reach other sectors that perhaps in other times would have forgotten because of our habit of forgetting our short memory, that life, water, is more important than paving over a wetland that helps prevent flooding, like the Texcoco Lake. It was a project that was condemned to failure, but it also put us at risk, and it was an excuse to keep expanding the megalopolis, because economic interest and the lack of justice aren't just involved in the airport and the construction of the airport. It also has to do with everything that would develop as a result of that, and everything it would bring. The hotels, the restaurants, and everything around there, complete change in the land use. Well, unfortunately, we've come to the end of the program. We know now that it's still not completely resolved, that there's a question about how to handle this issue of discontinuing a project that's already fairly advanced 
and particularly about the financial side of it. So I'm sure that the People's Front in Defense of the Land won't be resting on their laurels, but we'll have to continue to monitor the situation as we will also. Thanks so much for being with us. Yes, the struggle hasn't ended. We won the national consultation. We took a step, politically speaking, but in practical terms, the construction continues. And we understand to a certain extent because it's a huge project with a lot of economic interests behind it. And the government that's on its way out, well, the previous governments too, but especially the Enrique Peña Nieto government, is leaving a huge business opportunity locked in. And we understand that part. But I think that this struggle, more than being against the airport, is against, it's for the lake, for life against money, against the mega projects of debt. These are projects of debt because they don't bring development in themselves. The communities aren't opposed to development, but we are opposed to the kind of project that is being installed that will lead to the breakdown of our community life and our lives themselves and puts at risk our health our communicating vessels, our relationships, our coexistence. But I think that this fight, this battle, also reflects a class struggle in a very clear way. It is the power of people organized with very limited resources, but with its most powerful resources to bring out trans about to bring about transformation against people with money and against the individuals who are accustomed to saying this is a commodity. This, which is life, is now a commodity because this is going to generate profit for me. Mm. So there are a lot of things we need to keep learning from. Our communities are still in resistance. We're still struggling. We can't let our guard down. Not even when the day comes that we finally see the airport canceled. Another so stage is starting, that, that and we continues. hope that it will be a stage of rebuilding, of recovering the lake, and through that, generating jobs. When the people with money say that they are going to give us jobs, we want to show them that the community is organized, working with the government that obeys and responds to the people's needs, have the capacity to create dignified jobs, jobs that respect life. Well, it's a huge challenge that you still have in front of you. Thanks so much for being with us. And thank you. We'll be back next week on Interviews from Mexico.